Okay, members. The next item on the agenda is questions to the Minister for Communities. Before I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt, I just want to inform members that question number eight has been withdrawn. Mr. Nesbitt. Question one. Thank you, and thank you to the member. Um, I am aware of concerns raised by representatives from a number of sports governing bodies about the impact of the latest rates revaluation for sports clubs. The assessment um, of rateable valuation is in the first instance a matter for my executive partner, the Minister of Finance. I am pleased to note that Land and Property Services will apply the sport and recreation relief and the community amateur sports club relief for qualifying sports clubs. These arrangements have not been affected by the revaluation Reval 2020. These measures were put in place to allow significantly reduced rates liability across the sports sector. In October 2016, this Assembly passed the necessary legislation to allow for enhanced rates relief for community amateur sports clubs. This allowed enhanced rate relief from 80 to 100 per cent for community amateur sports clubs who do not operate social club bar facilities. In addition, sports clubs that are neither community amateur sports clubs or registered charities are still benefiting from an 80 per cent reduction in rates on the parts of their facilities that are used solely for sport and recreational purposes. I would encourage those governing bodies and clubs concerned about the effect of the revaluation exercise um, and who operate facilities that do not qualify for rate relief to address their concerns through the appropriate channel in land and property services. I thank the Minister. Um, given that some of the percentage increases in NAV are in the region of 30 and in some cases over 40 per cent, including double digits, I may say, for Casement Park, which is not, as the Minister will know, currently operational uh, as a sports ground, how does she square that with the programme for government's uh, objective of increasing the well-being of all and the specific outcome of promoting longer, healthier and more active lives. Surely this is entirely in the wrong direction of travel. Thanks very much for the question. I suppose the first thing is, is that sports play as a key role within our society, obviously in terms of engagement, in terms of health um, outcomes um, for all age groups and also bringing uh, varying groups together to enjoy sports. I would say in the impact of this, this revaluation that any uh, governing body or indeed any club should follow the process that is set out, that if they do have concerns with the increase, that they should be speaking to Latin Property Services and also speaking to their governing bodies as well um, in terms of, I haven't received any correspondence as yet from governing bodies and clubs and I'm obviously open to speaking to them in terms of looking at the impact. But there is a process there if they're not falling within the rate, uh, rebate system. And obviously where they are um, having a financial income through other means, they need to be looking at that as well to ensure that that's as fit for purpose as it can be. Call Mr David Hilditch. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for an answer so far, but this goes over and beyond the current relief that's available. Will, will the Minister make representation to your executive colleagues uh, regarding sports clubs who are absolutely hammered in this refall 2020, where in reality the club houses, houses have limited opening hours and are purely operational simply to raise money to sustain the clubs in the sport? Refall 2020 could be the death knell of many clubs and sporting organisations. Thanks very much for your question. Well, as I said, I haven't had any approach yet by governing bodies or clubs. I'm obviously open to listening to any of those that want to come forward. Um, in the first instance, obviously, looking at the revaluation sits within the finance department, but I would encourage any um, governing body um, or indeed any club to engage urgently with Latin Property Services because there is a dedicated process there. Um, in looking at what the valuations have brought up. So I would encourage any club or body to go to LPS. Call Shania Dennis. Thank you. The Minister has answered my supplementary in a previous answer. Thank you. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, on the subject of the financial, fi the financial viability excuse me, of our sports clubs, could the Minister give consideration to meeting with uh, groups who are um, campaigning or advocating for an All-Ireland Soccer League um, 
to find out from them what their proposals are in terms of improving the viability of football on both sides of the border on an all island basis, given that they've also made clear that they respect the, you know, the integrity of two different national teams. There's a request in the system for a meeting, and we're just working through the processes um, to ensure that a meeting happens in the near future. So I can update members once that takes place. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Speaker, and I thank you to the Minister for her answers thus far. In relation to viabilities of sporting clubs and following on from the ongoing governance and accounting concerns relating to Sport NI, uh, has the Minister had an opportunity to read the Lessons Learned report, which reported in June 2019? And if so, is she satisfied with its conclusions? In terms of, thank you, looking at the issues surrounding Sport NI, I am currently going through those at the moment. Um, I'm looking at the valuations, looking at next steps forward. I'll be engaging with Sport NI directly as well, and I'll update members in due course. I call Mr John Blair. Question two, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you for your question. And my department is the lead on producing a number of strategies which could support the programme for government as outlined in New Decade New Approach. These include the anti-poverty and child poverty strategy, a disability strategy, gender strategy and sexual orientation strategy, the principles and practice of people and community engagement, co-design and co-production will be a key part of the development and delivery of each of these strategies. The approach taken will be tailored to each individual strategy depending on delivery time skills and work completed to date. I am keen to involve people who will be most affected by the strategies at all stages of the strategy development and will ensure that steps are taken to allow them to take a meaningful contribution to this work. I am committed to ensuring that the most vulnerable in our society have their voices heard and their views taken into account. Mr Blair for a supplementary. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister for the, that reply, reply so far, and in this my first exchange with her at question time, wish her well and welcome her to, to, to her post. Um, can I ask, uh, in addition to, to the question already put, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, C can the Minister uh, give me an assurance that given the long list of outstanding strategies uh, around social inclusion and change, and uh, a list perhaps you could argue renewed by the New Decade New Approach Agreement, C can we have the assurance that the Department will seek to involve stakeholders, a wide range of stakeholders, from the outset of any consultation, and that stakeholders will not simply wait until some way down the process when questions have already been set by departmental officials? Minister. Thanks very much for your supplementary, and this is an important area, um, Member. And I think if we're going to do a co-design approach, that that has to be built in from the very start. It can't be something that's just attached to the end. As I said in my uh, opening uh, remarks, that we have to ensure that our policies, our strategies impact on those who need it the most, and that's the service users, those who do feel the impact. So they have to be an integral part to the co-design process, and that will be something that they will be built in from the very start. I call Ms Emma Sheeran. Uh, thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, campaign groups have been promised a disability forum now for a number of years. Uh, when is this going to be implemented, and can the Minister advise if this forum will be the vehicle for co-design of a new disability strategy? I am obviously um, considering the establishment of a disability stakeholder forum as part of the development of the new disability strategy. The role and remit of this form uh, will need to be considered in the context of the programme for government and enhanced arrangements for gross departmental collaboration. And once I um, have considered that uh, in the coming weeks, I will outline plans to members in the time ahead and also what the composition of that forum will be. Call Mrs. Sinead Bradley. Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, um, I welcome the Minister's comments about reaching out to vulnerable groups. Could she give an assurance that those hard to reach minority groups will be included, particularly those who will be directly affected by any strategies? Thanks very much for the question. And I think it's essential that we reach out to all groups, particularly those that are furthest removed. A co-design process 
obviously works with those who have a lived experience in terms of the topic that would be at hand and then also looking at professional expertise and trying to bring both together and obviously we want to democratise these policies and strategies as much as possible. So I will be looking at who can be involved in that, how we can use the community and voluntary sector, for example, to reach out to those hard to reach communities and individuals in the time ahead. And as we start to move through each of the strategies, co-design um, around the pol policy development and methodology will be key. And I will outline how we're going to approach that as I move forward. Mr. Andrew Muir. Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, first of all, I wish to welcome the Minister to her post. I have enjoyed working with the Minister for the last number of years, and uh, I look forward to doing that uh, in the position of Minister for Communities. Uh, as part of that, uh, ministerial responsibility includes the area of sexual orientation and um, policy responsibility in relation to that. What does the Minister plan to do to discharge that, to improve the lives of LGBT citizens within Northern Ireland, who frankly haven't been very well served by this Assembly previously, and I think it's an opportunity for the Minister to take forward action in relation to that. So what practical actions is the Minister planning to take to improve the lives of LGBT citizens in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for your questions. I suppose around all of these strategies, which in, in ways are interdependent on each other, um, there is within the new decade, new approach, a commitment to within three months, obviously, of the institutions being up and ru running, that I will publish a comprehensive timetable for the development and the delivery of each of these strategies, and that's something that I will keep to. In terms of looking at our LGBT plus community and the sexual orientation strategy, I think the first thing is to ensure that I engage, that I listen um, with that community from the outset and indeed I am in the middle of arranging meetings um, to start those initial engagements. Uh, there is obviously the draft of a sexual orientation strategy that's sitting there. We need to make sure that it's fit for purpose in terms of now because things have moved on. And the big issue is around making sure that um, all of these strategies support uh, the community, that they give visibility to the community, that they give respect to the community, but importantly, that we embed international human rights into our own domestic situation, um, that we're upholding that, and that we do have a co-design approach that the community themselves are involved within that, and particularly the hard to reach those voices that may not be heard at the moment. And so there's a commitment to do that, and of course, listening to the members within this chamber as well, um, who work with communities already um, to ensure that the strategy, uh, that the policy is fit for purpose. I call Mr. William Irwin. Number three, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Thanks very much uh, for your question. Um, and whilst I have no plans at the moment to introduce specific event scheme uh, within the cities, my department's regional development office works closely with Armagh, Bambridge and Craigavon District Council and Newry and Mourne and Down District Council to develop and deliver regeneration projects in Armagh and Newry retrospectively. The regional development office provides capital grant funding to those councils for a number of initiatives such as public realm and revitalisation schemes and these often include funding for event infrastructure or equipment. For example, previous public realm schemes uh, have created event spaces and best spoke lighting and revitalisation projects have funded the purchase of mobile stage equipment and public address systems for the use of council events. My department has also provided funding to councils for the promotion and marketing of their own town centres and city centres. This support often goes towards the promotion and funding of specific events such as Christmas markets and community events, which animate the, phys the physical spaces created. I am content that the mechanisms that already exist between my department and these two councils are sufficient to allow any grant funding of events, and I have no plans to replicate the Belfast scheme within Uri and Armagh. Mr. Irwin. Can I thank the Minister for a response? I'm sure the Minister will accept that Belfast City is in a similar position, but the amount of money I'm told is £200,000 for events. The Minister agree with me that a much smaller amount of money for the two cities in question that I mentioned, Uri and Armagh, uh, would make a big difference to both cities. In terms of resources that have went in since, I suppose, April 2011 into the areas of Armagh and Uri, there's been 6.5 million in capital investment, 
and also 493,000 in revenue. As was stated earlier, a large part of that is also for events and funding, and I am willing to engage with the council areas in the time ahead to look at what else the department can do. But um, a large scope of that money is going into events in which those council areas are coming forward with. But I'm more than willing to discuss that further. Mr. Justin McNulty. Um, thank the Minister for her responses thus far, and can I welcome her to her post and wish her well um, in her role. Uh, my constituency of New York is rich in culture. We have our rhymers, our bullets, our dramatists, our musicians, poets, and Cur de Mayer springs to mind, and the Calliac Burr, which sent shudders of fear through me as a child. I want to welcome the Minister's Department's, uh, capital, uh, the Minister's uh, Department's capital investment in the new cultural land at Enochwaka in Armagh City, which I am excited to say is due for opening next week, or sorry, next month. Will the Minister take this opportunity to wish the group well, and will she bring forward a support scheme to help develop and celebrate cultural heritage in places like the new cultural land in Enochwaka in Armagh? Thanks very much for the question, um, and I'm hoping to actually attend the opening event uh, next month in March uh, to go and visit the project just to see it firsthand, the excellent work that is being done, and obviously this does add to the cultural tapestry and vibrancy of our places um, and of our communities as well. I will be considering all of this in the time ahead just to see what further programmes can be looked at in terms of supporting this type of work, and I will outline that in the time ahead once that's considered. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And in light of all politics being local, uh, would the Minister maybe make comment and perhaps uh, look at possible funding opportunities and streams for the biggest one day festival in Northern Ireland, that being the Sham Fight in Scarva on the 13th of July? <laughs> I'm not aware of any request that has been in around that. It's something I would have to look at um, in terms of events. Obviously, working closely with local government will be key in terms of making sure that we can maximise and also an assessment of community impact that events have and also the investment around how it attracts visitors and stuff to a certain place. So I'm more than willing to speak with any local council and any member in the time ahead to look at events um, that will transform our spaces and also attract visitors, both locally and internationally. I was worried at the sham fight. You never know who's going to win. Um, Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'll not talk about the Port of Fray Gala, but instead go to question four. <laughs> Thanks very much uh, for the question. And I, I am committed to delivering on the pledge made in the new decade new approach that the executive will examine options to remove the historical debt from the housing executive. I have already met with Minister Murphy to discuss the matter and to explore what may be done in relation to the housing executive's landlord legacy debt. As members may already be aware, the historic debt results from loans which were generally taken out to finance new build housing activities by the Housing Executive and its predecessor organisations, including the Housing Trust and former local authorities. The level of historic debt, including both capital and interest outstanding, at the 31st of December 2019 was £332 million. This is due for repayment to the Department of Finance and Councils by 2036-37. There is a significance to the housing executive debt because of the massive investment challenge it faces if it is to provide a sustainable and long-term future for its portfolio of social homes. Action on the housing executive may play a part in addressing this, albeit a minor part alongside many more substantial actions. Revitalisation of the housing executive is key, and I will engage on this in the time ahead. Call Ms Armstrong for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister. I appreciate that this is a big issue um, for your department and especially for the Housing Executive. Um, could I ask if you could provide any of the actions that you've considered to date, or if you could even provide them in writing, um, as to how to future proof the Housing Executive and what plans do you have going forward to make sure the Housing Executive is stable, is out of debt, and then fit for purpose to deliver the very much needed housing that we need across Northern Ireland? 
We're currently, um, I'm looking at considering the revitalisation of the Housing Executive and obviously there will be a number of levers that we need to look at um, over the next 10 years. Once I finalise my view and future direction on this, I will obviously inform this chamber and the committee in the time ahead. Thank you. I call Ms Carol McCullum. I thank the Minister for her response, particularly to Kelly Armstrong's question. Mine is similar in terms of the new decade, new approach document has within it the um, potential for removing historic debt from the housing executive. What I'd like to ask the minister, minister is: Will she ensure that um, if any proposals to increase rents are matched against affordability? And secondly, also to look at um, how are these commitments around the, the revitalisation, but indeed the removal of historic debt will be um, delivered within this assembly. Minister. Thanks very much for the question. Obviously, affordability is key um, because we don't want to increase the burden on to um, the renter, but also in terms of the, the public purse. So we will be looking at revitalisation of the housing executive in the whole. That also looks at investment opportunities in terms of existing stock and then looking at the wider housing stock um, more extensively. We're obviously, I've raised this with the Minister of Finance along with the issue of corporation tax. Um, and obviously, while these will provide um, some solutions, um, a complete look at the revitalisation of the housing executive will be needed over the next 10 years um, in terms of looking at issues of the debt, looking at the income that's generated, but importantly, looking at how we can maintain existing stock whilst also looking at an ambitious housing programme in the time ahead. But obviously, the renter, uh, the person who is within each of these homes, uh, need to be protected in all cases. Mr. Robin Newton. Mr. Deputy Spe Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers uh, thus far. Uh, I note that the Minister has used the word revitalisation several times in, in the, uh, her answers to this question. Will the Minister be considering revitalisation to include the potential of the housing executive? building new, new homes, and will the Minister consider where there is a demolition of Northern Ireland Housing Executive homes, that those sites would in fact become and stay, will stay within and become an asset of the Northern Ireland Housing Executive? Thanks very much. We'll be, I'll be looking at all options um, at the moment in terms of house building. Obviously, Per annum at the moment, we built 1,750 new bills. Now, that's the majority all within housing associations. And obviously, when you look at the increased housing need, that's not enough um, in terms of meeting that need in the time ahead, and particularly those in uh, critical need. Um, so, we, I'll be looking at this overarchingly in the time ahead. Obviously, dealing with the debt issues, the issues around corporation tax, is one element of what needs to happen within the housing executive. We do need to look at the rents um, in a more holistic way um, as well, and also to look at other solutions, looking at other means of financing. There's obviously um, financial transactions capital. There's the ONS uh, legislation that needs to come forward in the coming period uh, as well. So I'll be looking at all of these options in the time ahead as I lay out my vision, my future approach to where um, housing is going to go, and I'll be doing that in the coming weeks and months. Call Mr. George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, question five. Thank you very much for your question. And I suppose in the latter part of 2019, the housing executive streamlined the adaptations process in the North region, mirroring the strategy that was so successfully piloted in the South region. This process continues to be reviewed, and I would be happy to provide the member with more information once the data is available. The Housing Executive has completed a review of the Disabled Facilities Grant process and a number of improvements have been implemented to streamline the process and improve the customer journey. These include carrying out the test uh, of resources process at the start, implementing a data sharing agreement with the Department for Communities to provide verification of benefits more quickly, enabling technical officers to manage a case from start to finish without additional handovers. The Housing Executive are also considering the role of grant case officers 
to enable them to be responsible for grant cases from start to finish. This aspect has not yet been implemented as they consider the level of authority associated with the, the case officer grade. In addition, the Housing Executive has specified, um, developed and implemented a new bespoke, more flexible IT system to support the grant process. These improvements have been implemented across all Housing Executive grant locations. Could I, ask, or could I thank the Minister for your question? Uh, could I ask her if she would meet with me to discuss some outstanding housing executive issues in my constituency? Yes, there's no problem. I can do that. Happy days. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, I welcome the, the Minister's uh, responses so far. In the Northern region, there is a very high uh, average age. And I'm not sure if the Minister knows how many people actually have passed away before the adaptations have actually been completed or shortly afterwards. Would the Minister be prepared to look at ways in which this whole process could be fast-tracked, not just through the assessment, but particularly through the planners who demand a whole uh, list of uh, requirements? which? to people suffering life-changing uh, experiences really can't wait. Yeah, thanks very much um, for your question. And I suppose, I mean, with all of these schemes, obviously we want to get the help to those who need it the most in the quickest time possible. Obviously the review is ongoing and I'll ask them to consider this as part of that in terms of tracking. And if the member wants to speak with my officials in terms of what else can be done, I'm more than willing to do that, but I'll raise this directly afterwards. Mr Chris Little. Question six. Thanks very much for the question. And I'm fully committed to developing the sub-regional stadia programme, which was included in New Decade New Approach Agreement and it is a priority for my department and indeed for the executive. This programme will transform soccer at all levels by addressing the current and future needs of the game. It provides a real opportunity to contribute to deliver um, uh, for wider government priorities and to address a range of social, economic and cultural issues. The programme itself must be open and transparent. It is critical that any improvements to existing stadia or new developments prioritise health and safety provisions, accessibility and inclusion, as well as being sustainable and based on realistic needs. A 12-week consultation on the programme proposals based on the IFA facility strategy dated 2011 took place on, from 30 November 2015, <coughs> closing on 22 February 2016. However, in the absence of ministers, no decisions were made on the programme proposals or on the financial allocations within the programme. Given that the IFA strategy with the consultation was, now, was based on is now nine years old, things have changed uh, in the interim also. I think it's only right that I take time to review uh, the programme. I have asked my officials in that regard to urgently engage with key stakeholders to help them inform the development of detailed plans for delivering a successful sub-regional programme. Once this engagement has been completed, I will then consider proposals on how best to take the programme forward as urgently as possible. Call Mr Chris Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will appreciate the extent of the frustration at the extreme delay of allocation of this funding. So can I ask when will the review complete and what budget will be allocated for the football stadia funding? Obviously, the previous commitment around the money that was uh, looked at was £36.2 million. We need to assess in terms of things have changed a lot over the na last nine years. And I wouldn't have been content to start allocating money without having an assessment of up-to-date needs. Um, and that's why I thought it was important to engage the stakeholders on the ground to get an update of where things are, where facilities sit, particularly because rule changes have happened within the last year or so as well, and that has had a knock-on effect in terms of soccer programmes. So my officials are doing that as urgently as possible. While they're also engaged, they're also looking at detailed implementation plans. And this will also develop a process for uh, criteria 
um, for application. So that will be coming back to me um, within the next three months, and then we'll be looking at that. If I can quicken that up in any way, I will do. There is literally about 30 seconds, so I call Karen Mullen and keep it snappy, and the Minister the same with the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Principal, Deputy Principal Speaker. Partly it has been answered, uh, Minister. It was just really a timeline around when the applications would be open. I can't give a specific timeline yet until the engagement takes place, uh, but once that's done, I will then develop a process and criteria for applications, which will include the definite timelines. Thank you, Minister. The time is now passed for uh, the written questions or the oral questions. It's time for topical questions. I call Mr. Trevor Lum. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome the Minister to our post? I haven't had the opportunity so far. Uh, the Minister will be aware from her previous existence on Belfast City Council of the planning decision that was made in respect of the Hillview site in North Belfast, which, which appeared to fly in the face of logic, and particularly in, in terms of the failure of retail on that site in the past and its long period of inactivity and being vacant. Can, I think the decision was taken three years ago now. Can she give us an assurance that should the opportunity arise that, that that site may yet be brought back into consideration for housing development rather than retail? I think I will be looking at all of this. Obviously, housing um, is a critical aim for me in the department in terms of increasing the availability of the social housing programme and trying to increase that over the coming years. And obviously, that is also part of the new decade, new approach that we have a more ambitious housing program to meet the needs and the increase in needs uh, that are there. As you'll be aware, obviously, Belfast City Council are conducting a strategic site assessment, looking at land within the city of Belfast. Um, and I know other councils are looking at this as well um, in other areas. And obviously, I've asked my officials to engage with Belfast City Council to look at what land availability there will be. So obviously, in certain areas, particularly when you look at Belfast, um, there's particularly chronic housing stress in areas like North Belfast. Land availability then becomes a critical issue uh, within that. So I want to do all that I can, use any instrument that I can within my department to prioritise housing, but particularly to do it on the basis of need. So where the housing need is, then that's where the new build should be uh, developed and focused. So I will be looking at that in the time ahead, and I can update the member as we move through that process. Call Mr Gary Middleton. Um, can I thank the Minister? Pardon? Mr Lunn, it was just you took so long asking for a question. <laughs> uh, only joking. Mr Lunn for a supplementary, then Mr Middleton. Thank Mr. you Lund. very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, and I thank the Minister for her detailed answer. Uh, she did mention at the end of her answer that decisions in terms of housing in North Belfast in particular would be based on need. So can I put it to her bluntly that uh, need shouldn't involve political considerations and that the absolute necessity in North Belfast of all places is to provide social housing and quantity as soon as possible? I am well aware of the, the issues uh, pertaining to North Belfast. Obviously, I can't speak for any previous decisions that were taken within this department. But for me, decisions should be based on the basis of need. Um, and that objective need where people then apply, where they're in housing stress, obviously that's assessed independently by the housing executive. Um, and I will be looking at uh, the housing programme matching where the need is greatest. And that's something that I want to commit to in the time ahead. Mr Gary Middleton. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, on Friday I had the opportunity to meet with uh, many community workers across my constituency in Foyle. Uh, one of the key themes of those meetings was around the issue of pay parity. Uh, some of them had concerns particularly around the neighbourhood renewal areas uh, and the difference in pay across various areas. Minister, is there anything that you are doing to try and address that issue? Thanks very much for your question. I suppose as somebody that once was a neighbourhood renewal worker, um, I'm well aware of the issues. I live in a neighbourhood renewal community in South Belfast, and I have met with officials only last week around the neighbourhood renewal programme. I will be uh, writing out the neighbourhood renewal partnerships within the next week, setting out my plans uh, for going forward over the next two years. Part of that will obviously look at a review of the neighbourhood renewal programme sitting below the anti-poverty strategy 
um, and co-design with neighbourhood renewal partnerships and others will be key to those strategies going forward in the time ahead because they are best placed to know the issues on the ground. The issue of pay party is obviously a key one and looking at issues there hasn't been an increase um, in salaries in the last 10 years so I have instructed a review um, of all community and voluntary sector work um, and where that impacts on, on workers and employment rights um, for that to be looked at in the time ahead. If I can move on that as urgently as possible around looking at neighbourhood renewal, then I will, but I have to wait on this review taking place first. Mr Middleton, for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her very detailed uh, response. Uh, another area which has been raised, again, it's around pay, but it's in relation to budgets as a whole, uh, the issue of yearly budgets, and we know that many community workers are under pressure in terms of their salaries and the fact that they, they run out and they don't have a budget in place. Is there anything, Minister, that you're doing to look at possibly extending that to maybe a three-year budget? This is obviously being considered in terms of the programme for government. Will eventually you look at multi-annual funding and budgeting. So this will be looked at and considered in line with that. And obviously as we're developing a new anti-poverty strategy and looking at where neighbourhood renewal sits within that programme. I will also outline some of my intention in the interim um, to those groups when I write to them this week. Ms Carol Nicolan. And the Minister will be aware of the United Nations reports previously into discrimination in housing, particularly in areas of Belfast and, and Derry. My question isn't about housing, it's because Trevor's asked that. I'm going to ask about gender um, and gender, uh, the, the, the elimination of all forms of gender discrimination. Um, and just would the Minister have any plans to bring forward the recommendations published by the, UNI, the UN Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women? Thanks very much. I suppose when I just came in to post a couple of weeks ago, uh, CEDAW, uh, we're holding a conference here looking at this very issue, and I just took the opportunity to speak to those stakeholders that were in the room. Obviously, as we're taking forward um, a gender strategy, this will be central, and I think it will be important for me, but also the executive, to ensure that we demonstrate how we're meeting international obligations, but importantly, where we're embedding, embedding a human rights-based approach to all that we're doing, and that includes gender equality at the heart of it. Thank the Minister for her response, and obviously, you know, central to all that will be uh, closing the gender pay gap, um, particularly the, in relation to Section 19 of the Employment Act of 2016. I, I would assume that the Minister would have that, certainly, as an integral part of work that needs to be brought forward in this issue. Just on that, yes, the implementation of Section 19 um, rests with uh, OFM, DFM, but my, um, I suppose I'm working with my executive uh, partners and also the officials are engaging with department officials there to ensure that we can take this forward as soon as possible. Call Mr Alec Eason. The, the Minister what steps her department can do to ensure that the Housing Executive address the many Housing Executive properties that suffer from damp? Yeah, there's a programme of maintenance um, that are ongoing within the Housing Executive. Obviously, there are bigger challenges that lie ahead in terms of, I suppose, keeping the existing stock um, fit for purpose, and that's part of the wider revitalisation work that we need to look at. Obviously, there's a, a huge investment that's needed within the existing stock of the housing executive over the next 10 years. So this will be an urgent priority, not just for myself, but also for the executive and for this assembly um, as a whole. And looking at issues of damp is key to that. If there are any specific issues or concerns that you have within your constituency, if you can follow up and we can get uh, the specifics answered to you. Call Mr Easton for a supplementary. Yeah, could I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Um, and as the Minister probably knows, um, the Housing Executive are very good at using condensation as a cover up for damp um, and for the lack of cavity wall insulation. Can the Minister ensure that she pushes the Housing Executive to actually address these issues? Yes, we'll have a meeting shortly with the Housing Executive, obviously as an arm's length body and as a key body um, in terms of looking at that. And this issue will be raised, particularly when you look at the 
the whole rounded nature of fuel poverty and poverty more generally. Obviously, living conditions are a key and fundamental part, so that's something that will be raised. Again, if you have any specifics or background, more than willing, if you can share those with me, and I can raise those directly also. Call Ms Sinead Ennis. Last can call you. Um, I, I note the conversation and the exchange of views that the Minister had with other members at the start of question time, but I'd like to ask the Minister, does she agree that sport and physical recreation make a major contribution to the health of the population and that increasing rates for sports clubs could have a negative impact? Minister? I think yes. Um, I visited a number of sports clubs. Uh, I was in Ballymacash on Friday. I was in East Belfast a few weeks ago looking at how sport is being used to tackle and deal with the issue of homelessness um, and engaging with uh, those communities that are falling on hard times. So obviously sport plays a vital role. Um, it reaches out to hard to reach groups, it engages people, it builds capacity and it really is a, a good contributor to what we try to do within society in terms of addressing poverty, inequality and a range of other issues. Um, I suppose the issue of rates, I covered it, it primarily sits within the Department of Finance um, and if specific clubs or organisations do have concerns, they should be addressing them through the process. That said, uh, the rates rebate still works for um, amateur clubs and those who are registered charities where they can get up to 80 per cent and sometimes 100 per cent uh, rates relief. I call Ms Ennis for a supplementary question. Uh, Gourmet, I'll get Minister. Um, <clears throat> I agree with what you've said, and I, I know obviously the first protocol for any clubs that have issues is, is LPS. But I suppose just taking into consideration what um, her department could do, and I'd ask the minister maybe to outline um, what support and information <clears throat> the, her department could provide to clubs in terms of their organisational structure um, and their govern governance, and to help them with a better understanding um, of the opportunities out there for rates relief. Yeah, more than happy. Whilst no organisation, no governing body or club has contacted my department as yet, that may be in part because they haven't received the bill yet in terms of what the revaluation does. So I'm more than willing to speak to any organisation or club, but I'll also instruct my officials um, just to liaise with sports clubs or go through the bodies and also Sport NI just to give an update on preparing clubs for the valuation or if they wish to make an appeal, just to set out what the process is. So I'll, I'll instruct officials to do that. Oh, sorry, no, no questions, please. Uh, last one, Courtney. Um, could I ask the Minister, what is she doing to ensure social inclusion and social cost strategies will be implemented based on objective need criteria? Thanks very much. Well, obviously, objective need was in the new decade, new approach um, as to a way of working. And obviously, all of the strategies that I will be taking forward um, that were discussed earlier, objective need will be at the core of them. Obviously, co-design and co-production with those groups that are mostly impacted will also be at the heart, and I will outline plans in the time ahead as to how we're going to net objective need in and what the approach will be. Karim Ogden, I'm going to thank the Minister for her answers, but just to follow on, in the absence of uh, anti-poverty strategy, how does the Minister intend to tackle poverty in the interim period? Well, there's been a range that my department obviously um, tackles poverty in a range of ways not least through recent moves around the extending the existing welfare mitigations. Obviously, one of those areas was the issue of the bedroom tax, um, where that has been extended indefinitely, so there's no cut-off date to the mitigation. I've also closed the loophole for those that have a change of circumstances, looking at the issue of the bedroom tax, and I'm also bringing forward regulations to extend the other existing mitigations. I will then, in the coming weeks, be outlining my approach to the wider social security issue and how it impacts on uh, people the most. And I will be setting out a way forward as to how we engage with those on the ground that are impacted by this, but then also working with support organisations such as Cliff Edge Coalition, the Human Rights Commission, um, and obviously Professor Ellie Nevison and Kevin Higgins, who were involved in the first round of mitigations. We obviously have an extensive neighbourhood renewal programme an area of risk programme, which we're going to be reviewing as well. And they target the top 10 uh, most percent communities. 
Um, an additional of other programmes is the Affordable Warmth Scheme, looking at fuel poverty, the issue of social supermarkets, and I'm also looking at trying to develop a cooperative development hub in the time ahead, looking at cooperative development and the idea of community wealth building. Um, and we're also starting as soon as, um, obviously, taking forward the anti-poverty strategy to do some stakeholder engagements within the coming weeks and months um, to make sure that we can speed up the introduction and the implementation of that policy. Thank you, members. Um, we move now to questions to the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Question number five has been withdrawn, and questions one and seven 2 and 13 have been grouped for answer. 